morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you to the many of you who are joining us from across the globe. Um, my name is Elizabeth Dolan, and I am a researcher and program manager at the Pulte Institute for Global Development here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, as an integral part of the Notre Dame's Keough School for Global Affairs, the Pulte Institute addresses global poverty and inequality through policy, practice, and partnership. Today, we are turning our focus to an extremely important topic, the human right to water, and how to interpret it and anticipate impacts in water-intensive industrial contexts. Environmental and social responses to, to today's biggest water challenges are incomplete, are insufficient, without consideration for the multidimensional human needs of water. Such needs do not end with water access or even water quality, but include cultural and social uses of water and the sustainability of use so that future generations can enjoy these same activities. This consideration is not just a complement to environmental activism or water stewardship, stewardship strategies, it is an integral part of them. This understanding of the human right to water is underdeveloped and it continues to be overlooked or inadequately protected in water intensive industrial contexts, such as the garment, beverage, mining and agricultural sectors. The theme for World Water Week this year is seeing the unseen, the value of water. How can we push industrial actors to see the unseen human right to water of the local communities in which they operate? Why should the responsibility to implement this right rest partially with them and not just the government? And why should we, an audience with a vested interest in strengthening water security efforts, prioritize the human rights agenda? Today's presentation will answer these questions and will unveil a framework in response to the need for a human rights consideration. We will first watch an introduction by Ray Offenheiser, the former director of Oxfam America and the current director of the Pulte Institute for Global Development, who will provide a brief introduction to the topic at hand and the particular framework our institute has developed to address this issue. We will then invite our partners at BHP, the Australia-based multinational mining company, to discuss why this framework is needed now and how this framework can promote best practices in industry. Then we will invite the architects of our framework, four world-class professors here at the University of Notre Dame to present on our unique, inherently multidisciplinary approach to the human right to water. The team consists of professors who represent the engineering, earth sciences, global affairs, business, and law schools at Notre Dame. We will close with final words from Tom Pirikow, the innovation and practice program director here at Pulte who brings extensive experience working as a practitioner within development spaces for over a decade while at Catholic Relief Services. And finally, I will serve as our MC for today's presentation and will be diligent in channeling questions to our team from you, the audience. Our team prides itself in being a gold standard presentation here at World Water Week, which includes supporting the voices of young researchers like myself. I invite you to actively participate by submitting questions in our chat which can be found on the online portal. We plan to address them along the way if we can, as well as during our Q&A session. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand over to Ray Offenheiser, Director of the Pulte Institute for Global Development to begin our discussion. He joins us by a previously recorded video. Thank you, Elizabeth, for uh, the introduction. What I'd like to do today to get us going in this conversation is provide some general background on the origin, goals, and implications of our research project. Water scarcity is a global crisis, I think we would all agree, further exacerbated today by climate change. Water security, both scarcity and excess, is rapidly becoming a matter of national security. And water-related conflicts are a major risk and challenge for governments and water-intensive industries across the world. In the face of this water security crisis, the critical questions become, who's entitled to water? How much, when, for how long, and of what quality? Finding answers to these questions of access, quality, and quantity will be a major challenge over the coming decades. These are critical questions for water intensive industries like mining, textiles, agriculture, and paper. Each of these industries require large volumes of water delivered 24 seven over decades 
if they're actually going to be able to sustain their operations, both operationally and financially. However, each of these industries operates in a context in which there are competing claims on water from diverse stakeholders. They might be native populations or agriculturalists, urban settlements, public utilities, etc. Which among these different groups have primacy of claim and on what legal or normative basis? What institution has the authority to decide? What set of principles should be used to guide that decision-making process? How should these rules or principles be enforced and sustained on an ongoing basis? And finally, is there some universal set of principles that might be applied across different national contexts to guide such decision-making? There's really no easy answer to these questions. Much depends on context, on history, on law, and on institutions. One framework that is gaining traction, however, in this space is a rights-based approach to water access. There is really actually a long history of legal systems of water distribution at the national level, particularly applied to complex irrigation systems. Each of these systems confer rights of access to agriculturalists across the entire system, and generally provide a system of governance to ensure that the rules and rights are respected. Today, rights questions around water have become more salient as many companies find themselves challenged by rights claims from native populations for whom access to a particular hydrological system has both livelihood and cultural significance. It is increasingly recognized that local communities or stakeholders asserting rights claims to water will likely become even more common in coming years as scarcity accelerates across the globe. The paper we present this morning is an attempt to look at water stewardship through a human rights lens and offer a practical approach to the implementation of a rights-based approach to water stewardship. So what were our goals and inspiration in producing this paper? Well, five years ago, the leadership of BHP's water division undertook a major review of its water portfolio with the goal of developing a state-of-the-art water stewardship policy. After considerable internal review and external consultation, they developed a draft policy, which they then presented to stakeholder groups over two years in various locations around the world. The question of how to reconcile good stewardship with a rights-based perspective on water, however, was a perplexing issue that came up in a number of these focus group sessions. Our partnership with BHP emerged out of the company's desire to sponsor a thought piece on how adopting a rights-based approach to water and water management might enable water-intensive industries of all types to recognize rights challenges a priori in all projects and more proactively and constructively address them. In approaching this work, we recognize that there has been a lot of excellent work done by scholars and other applied researchers on water rights, on jurisprudence, on governance, and on hydrology, all with an interest in trying to provide more contemporary frameworks for thinking about water sharing in complex environments among highly diverse stakeholders and doing it in ways that might reduce potential for conflict and achieve more equitable outcomes. We have reviewed and drawn upon much of that literature in what, we're trying, what we've tried to do. In our review of that material, however, we drew several conclusions. First, we found that the critiques were in fact very compelling and the patterns of institutional behavior leading, however, led to very similar outcomes. Second, we found that much of the critical literature tends to be highly siloed into human rights, governance, or hydrological frames. Seldom, however, did we find work that actually worked across boundaries and blended these disciplinary fields. And finally, we found that while the researchers have perhaps clearly defined the problem or problems common to many of these large water intensive industri industrial projects, they have not necessarily given industry the tools to evaluate the risks and opportunities a priori. There's really no good strategy yet for, enduring, for ensuring legal adherence, encouraging ethical behavior, or locating ways in which a company can go above and beyond to expand the enjoyment of the right to water. Any existing framework on human rights only focuses on measuring violation. In our view, what's needed is a mindset shift that sees advancing equity and rights proactively as good for both business and society. With these considerations in mind, we thought it might be most useful to move beyond these excellent critiques, bring a transdisciplinary approach to these issues, and try to offer a framework and a tool that might take us from concept to implementation of a rights-based approach to water. Our paper, therefore, is a modest attempt to move future research more in this direction. Given the unique context-specific nature of any large-scale water-intensive project, we feel both a systems perspective and an interdisciplinary approach are critical. Anchoring our approach in a systems perspective of, of the hydrological system that will be disrupted by a new project 
we feel enables us to embed added analysis of governance and a rights dimension within, a very, within very clear technical parameters. Companies are, of course, never obligated to protect the entire world, but only those parts of the world that their processes impact both directly and indirectly. Having such technical parameters, while perhaps not a perfect barometer of the nature of change in a system, they do provide a basis for thinking in temporal terms about the short and long-term impacts on the system and on the durability of access and supply to ensure both equity and sustainability. We are also acutely aware that both national and international jurisprudence on water is undergoing significant change over the past several decades, and that tools that can bring together data on hydrological parameters over time with assessments of institutional governance and rights provisions in an integrated way will serve governments, industry, and civil society well as they work their way through the thorny issues of water sharing in real time during the life cycle of large projects. Our presentation today will dive deeper into the benefits of implementing a comprehensive human rights approach and offer a new framework as one strategy for pursuing a water secure world through a human rights lens. I regret that I'm not, be, I'm not able to join my team in presenting today, but I do wanna leave you with three main takeaways. First, the importance of moving beyond siloed perspectives toward more interdisciplinary work on water management, we feel is critical to advancing greater equity and sustainability. Second, we believe that linking the technical detail of hydrological systems to social and institutional practices of water management opens new ways of examining the challenges of sustaining rights obligations of access, supply, and quality. And finally, we believe in the need to give greater focus to, to the underlying context and power relations, both visible and invisible, that often undermine reasonable efforts at equity and water governance. Here at the Pulte Institute, we envision a water secure world where all people can enjoy access to and use of adequate and sustainable supplies of quality water, while at the same time ensuring its social and cultural significance for generations to come. We hope at the end of our presentation, you will have a better understanding of some of the options for pursuing such a vision through a rights-based approach. I will also feel compelled to work in your own ways toward better defining and protecting this human right. I would like to now pass off the rest of um, the presentation to um, my team members and uh, who will lead you through the remainder of the presentation. Thank you all very much. All right, well, to build off this introduction, we are fortunate to have with us this morning our two key collaborator collaborators from BHP, Jed Youngs, the Practice Lead Water Stewardship, and Ann Decker, Vice President Environment, who was very centrally involved in the production of BHP's current water stewardship policy with BHP's group environment, environment team. We thought we might begin with a brief conversation with Jed about BHP's interest in this work and how they see it advancing their thinking about water stewardship. So I invite Tom Pierkow, the Innovation and Practice Program Director here at Pulte to lead this discussion. Great, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Welcome, Jed. It's good to be with you and, and to our, our audience today. And um, thanks for taking some time out to uh, have a, just a, a Q&A and answer some questions. And, and thanks for all your collaboration and contribution to this space. I, I have a few questions, as Elizabeth mentioned, and uh, I'll cluster a few of them. Um, feel free to take them piecemeal and uh, however you feel works out best for you. So the first question I've got for you, Jed, is why did BHP see a need to explore this water and human rights interface. What are some of the conversations that led you to support the University of Notre Dame in designing this and, and, and then why now? Thanks, Tom. Um, and it's great to be with everyone today. And, um, and and I think kind of my role here really is to offer some thoughts that might help other companies to understand why this framework that, um, that the University of Notre Dame is developing could be useful for, for them as well. I mean, as, as Ray touched on the idea for the framework, it came from the roundtables that, uh, which Ray mentioned. <clears throat> the BHB organized a few years ago with um, leading players in, in water research and civil society to help us shape our approach to water stewardship. And those roundtables, they were, they were incredibly helpful in, in doing just that. And what we heard from those groups was important in us ultimately setting a, I think setting a pretty high bar for ourselves in water stewardship and also determining what our priorities and our strategy to achieve those priorities should be, all of which is, is outlined in our water stewardship position statement. But one of those priorities um, that we landed on was to improve general water governance, transparency and collaboration you know, where, we, where we thought we could. 
And at the round table, you know, we asked people where they thought were the gaps that we could contribute to together. And one of the areas that arose is, is the one that we're talking about today, the fact that human rights to access water, the, the physical, the cultural, the economic needs is not properly considered. And more than that, that we don't really have a good way to do it. And, and Ray, who we just heard from, was one of the, the strongest voices in, in raising this issue, although he was too modest to say that. Um, and that led us to work with the University of, of Notre Dame on this. Um, and since that time, a few years ago, human rights have been gaining prominence in a, in a broader sense also as, a, as an underpinning principle. Um, and a great example of that, I think, is the recognition last year by the UN Human Rights Council of the, the right for people to have access to a, to a healthy environment. So I think that basic gap, which was identified in the, in the roundtables, as well as those recent developments, um, Tom, I think they really highlight why the work that we're discussing today is so important. That's great, Jed, and, and, and I commend you for your work in assembling these roundtables, and, and thanks very much for the, for the work that you guys have been doing in this space. And as you mentioned, you're no novices to this area. You, you, you've been doing quite a bit of work in developing your position statements and policies. How do you foresee that this framework that we've been developing, promoting or strengthening BHP's current water stewardship policy? How would this really help advance the work that you're doing in terms of your policy? And what would incorporating a stronger rights dimension into your water stewardship approach look like actually from an operational perspective and or a, a corporate responsibility perspective, you think? Sure, I mean, I, I might tackle that from a slightly, perhaps even a slightly broader perspective and, and uh, think about what it means for, you know, for our, our company strategy as a whole. Um, because I think the two are quite quite connected, and maybe if I if I can, I'll start with some very brief context to, to help explain that. So as as BHP, we have large mining operations with associated ports and infrastructure, which are which are there for a long time, often over a hundred years, and also the operations being you know being the scale they are, they're often a big part, or they usually in fact are a big part of the landscape and of the community, and um, we tend to think of water as a as a blue thread that connects our operations to those to those things. So it is it is really important that we manage water for the long term and in doing so that we recognize critically the environmental effects of our place in that landscape, um, absolutely, but also the part that water plays for people. And that includes not only, uh, I guess I could say the more obvious things like water for other industries, but also some of the subtler values like how water sustains indigenous cultures, which I think you know, many of us around the world are trying to are trying to understand and appreciate better. So if we take that back to the strategic benefit of work like this for, for a company like ours, well, you know, in BHP, as, as many companies are, we're looking for, for new opportunities as well. And, and in our case, that means trying to build our portfolio and minerals that will support the, the global energy transition like copper and nickel. And that can mean moving into new countries or regions. And to do that, you know, we obviously have to be accepted by the local governments and the communities and, and they will quite naturally look at how well we've treated people where we are now. So we see it as really important to, to get that right and um, you know we welcome approaches that, that help us to do that well because you know as Ray touched on at the start um, it is a fairly complex space and um, you know there is a gap there in, in, in having an approach that helps, uh, helps an organisation to understand how well we're doing in that space. That's great, Jed, thanks. You, you reference government as one of the stakeholders that you would be looking to, to make sure that you have good relationships with and uh, as, you, as you look at your operations. People often view the protection of human rights as a responsibility of government. Why should other companies, especially those who are water intensive, involve themselves in human rights promotion? And, and where do their obligations end from your perspective? Yeah, well, well, I mean, clearly there is a responsibility for, for any organisation to understand what the global community agrees is a basic human right, um, to respect that and, and to do their best to support it. And I think, I think that is a given, really. Um, but it also makes good business sense. I mean, companies, companies want to be and, and are increasingly expected to be good for society and not only for the bottom line. And sustaining human rights has to be an essential part of that. 
and, and in a business sense, it can also provide um, or increase certainty as well, because considering these needs up front means that a business is, is less likely to be challenged on them later. As to the question of where do the obligations end? Well, I mean, there is clearly a limit to what any individual company or organisation can do. And at some point, you do need a, a governance framework to help organisations to work together and so that there's a level playing field that, that helps to draw those organisations into each other. And again, as Ray touched on uh, up front, companies do have a limited footprint that they can influence. And outside those footprints, there need to be others who are contributing as well. So I don't think that either governments or corporates can do this alone. There needs to be a, there needs to be a joint commitment in a, in a space like this. Very helpful. Thanks, Jed. Just thinking about the, we, Ray was already alluding to, and I think we will continue to talk about this interdisciplinary and multi-stakeholder dimension of, of really how this issue really needs to be governed. Um, and, and so what much of your, what you're speaking to, I think really will, will, will help us kind of think about this as we continue the conversation. As we look towards the future, how might a rights, a kind of a human rights implementation approach transform, you think, water intensive industries then? Yeah, well, again, I think I'd go back to something that Ray acknowledged in his introduction, um, which is that this is a contribution to the body of knowledge. <clears throat> and I do think we need to see some of it play out in practice to understand just how different it is from, from what is currently happening. Um, <clears throat> and it will probably make more sense or more difference in areas where the, the regulatory framework is, is less mature. Although we may be surprised in some places where we think it is mature. So you know, I think much of the answer to your question will come out over time. Um, but, but it does seem that considering human rights more deliberately in the way that organisations work and interact with people around them, it should naturally lead to a stronger foundation for those organisations within their communities and perhaps a better sense of, of connection and legitimacy in the eyes of those communities. And the other thing, the other thing that... Um, I really hope that this will help with is to, is to think about human rights across the many actors involved. So if I could draw an analogy, one of the things that, that many people and, and groups grapple with and which the mining industry is, is very conscious of is the, the cumulative environmental impact that occurs across a catchment when there are many mines, municipal water supplies, industrial water diversions and so on that, that have an environmental effect upon, upon water resources. So taking account of all of those things and, and thinking of them in a collective sense. And this is, this is a very complicated space for operators and regulators and other stakeholders. And, um, and really, we haven't really cracked it, even though it has been worked on by many people for decades. And, and it seems that the world hasn't really started to think about how to do the same thing for people. And it's clear that a common approach will be very important to doing that, which is, you know, which is what this framework aims to be. And that's why, you know, it's certainly in my mind, this paper is not designed, or certainly not for the mining industry alone, or even just for corporates, because if it's going to be effective, it really has to be useful for, for everyone, for all sectors. Um, so really, I'd like to think that the industry and governments will welcome this framework that the University of Notre Dame is developing, because ultimately, it should help us all to, to manage water as the shared resource that we know it is. I appreciate that, Jed. That's a, probably a good place to leave us in reminding us that this is a complex issue and that it's going to take collaboration from the part of a number of actors. And so thanks again for, for this time today, uh, but then also for your continued collaboration and your work in this space. Uh, I guess at, at this point, I'll, I'm going to hand it back over to Elizabeth. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And thanks, Jed, so much for your perspective um, on this issue and on the human right to water in water intensive industrial context. Um, and just so the audience knows, um, Jed and his colleague Anne will be staying on for the Q&A session. So if you have any questions for them, um, you're more than welcome to address them um, to them as well as to our research team. And so without further ado, now I'm gonna turn to my colleagues, professors Mark Muller and Ellis Adams to introduce us, inter officially introduce the framework that we've produced um, in response to this gap that Jed has been talking about. Just as a brief um, kind of profile overview, Mark Muller is an assistant professor in the departments of civil and environmental engineering and earth sciences. He focuses predominantly on areas of climate change, water resources and conflict with a particular interest in areas that have little available data. 
Ellis Adams is an assistant professor of geography and environmental policy at the Keough School for Global Affairs. And his research has mainly focused on understanding human water interactions in urban contexts in the global south. So Mark and Ellis, I'll pass off to you to present on our approach to implementing the human right to water. Yeah. Can you hear me? Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for being a part of our session. Um, it's been a, a great opportunity to be able to work on these frameworks. Um, before we proceed to share what the framework um, is and how to implement or use it in operations, um, it's important to lay right up front what we believe the framework is and what it is not in terms of its values. Um, first of all, we look at this framework um, as a tool for businesses to implement the human right to water. So that's sort of the obvious application of the tool. We believe that in doing that, this framework can help businesses be more resilient over time as they incorporate uh, more dimensions of human right into their operations. We believe that given that the application brings industry in close contact with communities that it can help foster and even improve business community relations. We also believe that the framework will be useful for setting standards on human right equity, particularly in the context of water use, sustainability, and as Jed mentioned, stewardship, which is very critical to the mining company and other intensive water users in their operations. It's also important to acknowledge that we do not intend that this framework is to be used as an audit tool. That wasn't the original intent. Its, it's main purpose is more preventive um, rather than being a remedial tool. So it helps you to get ahead of the issues before they even arise in your operations. And finally, we do not intend that a framework is to be used to assert legal liabilities or for companies to use as supplementary to CSR reports or to even replace those reports. Who can benefit from the framework? Our original intent has been to focus on the intensive water use industries, and this is anywhere from mining, garment and textiles, beverages, hydropower, agriculture. Um, what have you, any sort of water intensive use that, that engages with communities can make use of the framework. But what's important and interesting about our framework is its application extends beyond that, right? Governments can use the framework. Other very important players in the water space can apply the framework in their own analysis of how industry interacts with communities. Other auditors, researchers that are interested or that work in this space, as well as engineers can also use the framework. And finally, we believe the local communities that are interested in understanding operations of water intensive industries can also apply the framework to do their own due diligence, to understand operations, to try to get ahead of issues and understand what the potential violations and potential impacts could look like. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Alice. <clears throat> so hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So conceptually, uh, I think really our framework fills the gap between universal principles on one hand. So you have you know, universal principles of human rights that are high level, that are applicable in many situations, but that are not specific. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to tie them uh, to measurable uh, indicators, so to say. And at the other hand of the spectrum, you have local impact assessments that are uh, carried out ubiquitously mm -hmm. and that are very quantitative, have many, many indicators, uh, perhaps too many indicators, uh, but no, not necessarily uh, a normative framework to actually act on these indicators. So for example, what do you do when the assessment points several different uh, areas uh, where for, for action, which one do you prioritize? And so our framework really bridges this gap. Uh, so first of all, we use uh, an adequacy and governance uh, lens to, uh, to uh, interpret uh, local assessments or to interpret indicators. And then we feed uh, these assessments into uh, rights metrics to link them to, uh, to human rights. 
Um, so what we'll do, what we'll do today very briefly, we'll go over those three key parts of our framework uh, to kind of give a bit more detail uh, so that you might understand, uh, you know, what's going on and how they might be impl uh, implemented. So to start with, uh, with adequacy, uh, the first thing you got to do is identify who the stakeholders are. So in this specific exa example, you have three different types of stakeholders. So stakeholders are defined by their types of livelihoods, perhaps their ethnicity, perhaps their location, uh, uh, you know, within the, the hydrological system. So in this case, let's say that we have three different types of stakeholders. We have uh, a forestry community upstream of the river. Uh, and then downstream, we have a fisher community and uh, another community practicing uh, irrigation uh, um, agriculture. The next step would be to then identify which are the hydro-industrial processes that actually might affect uh, water accessibility for these communities, for these stakeholders. So these uh, hydro-industrial processes could be distinct for a given infrastructure. So in this particular case, let's say that we have a dam that is planned to be built on the river. Um, the first, um, uh, the first hydro-industrial processes is the dam itself, right? So the filling of the dam, which will affect water availability downstream, but on a temporary basis, right? Once the dam is filled, then this process uh, ceases to exist. But then after that, the dam needs to be operated. Let's say that the, that the dam operates for hydropower that will affect water variability downstream, which has a distinct effect on livelihoods uh, from uh, water scarcity uh, associated with the filling of the dam. And let's say that the dam is a multi-use uh, infrastructure uh, the, and the water impounded is also used by a factory uh, for industrial processes and then put back into the stream, but in a different, in a, in a different state than uh, the water that's been taken uh, from the reservoir. Let's say that it has a different temperature, um, a different uh, chemical composition, uh, the water is then polluted. So we have, we've identified three uh, hydro-industrial processes and three stakeholders in this case. And the next step is then to fill the matrix. And to do that, we use a variety of dimensions uh, of water resources that have been drawn from uh, several, uh, you know, from this, the state of the art in terms of, of water accounting. So the first dimension is blue water. It's perhaps the most, um, the most intuitive of all. So blue water is water that you can move around, uh, that you can manage, that you could store, that has, that has a high opportunity cost. So in this particular case, uh, the filling of the dam, for example, will flood the upstream community. So you have an excess in blue water upstream of flooding, but it will uh, uh, cause blue water scarcity downstream, which has a direct implication for the communities doing uh, irrigation agriculture. A second dimension is green water. So green water is, as opposed to blue water, it's water that you cannot move around, water that's uh, coming from rainfall and then being stored either as soil moisture, as biomass, etc. Now, this is uh, a dimension of water that is typically less affected by hydro-industrial processes, uh, you know, unless they affect climate patterns. So let's say, for example, that the dam here is large enough, the reservoir is large enough to, to actually affect rainfall patterns. And in that case, we'll have uh, a change in, uh, in green water availability. The third dimension is economic. Um, so economic water scarcity or economic water adequacy refers to the situation where water is actually available, but the uh, infrastructure to access it uh, is actually missing. So in this particular case, for example, uh, let's say that the, the, the factory releases polluted water down into the stream. The water is physically available for um, uh, the irrigation, uh, you know, the irrigators to be used, but they cannot, they, uh, they, they must treat it and they don't have access to the infrastructure to actually treat the water. And it's important to identify this type of scarcity because it could be remediated potentially with enough investment, right? So if the, if the community has access to enough money to actually build a treatment plant, then this type of water inadequacy will be alleviated. A fourth type of water inadequacy has to do with virtual water. So virtual water refers to the relationship between water and food. Um, so it arises when the lack of water affects potentially the ability of a community to access foods. Uh, so it affects uh, the food security of the community. So if the water is polluted, the enough, the, uh, the irrigation community cannot use it to produce food. If they don't have any alternative food sources, then uh, they're facing virtual water inadequacy. However, this virtual water inadequacy could be potentially remediated through subsidizing, right? So let's say that they cannot, the community cannot have access to the traditional uh, food source, but they have access to funding to actually buy the food on the market that would alleviate the, the virtual dimension of, uh, of water inadequacy. However, it's also 
likely and possible that the traditional uh, agricultural practice has a deep cultural value for the community. And so not having access to it, even though it might not affect their food security, could still uh, be, uh, be a liability, right? And so in this case, uh, we talk about cultural uh, water inadequacy. So there's enough physical water or virtual water to survive, but this is not the water that used to have a very strong cultural or spiritual meaning for the community. Now, this type of assessment could be, of course, applied to all the relationships between hydro industry processes and stakeholder categories in order to establish a profile of, uh, of, of water adequacy that could then be interpreted uh, with the lens of human rights. So moving to the uh, second part of the framework, I'm going to pass it on to, uh, to Ellis, who will talk a little bit about how we interpret uh, water governance. All right, Mark, uh, thank you for your analysis on water inadequacy. Um, so the second aspect or component of our framework is the water governance analysis. And let me briefly define governance as any, any sort of social systems or institutions within which water location um, and use is embedded. And that would include both formal and informal institutions. Very important uh, to recognize that. In our report, we have a more extensive set of questions to use for the governance analysis, but for the purposes of this presentation and in the interest of time, I will keep it simple and pick some very important or core aspects. So the first step in the analysis of governance is to understand how power actually operates across different actors and stakeholders. And here, the goal is to understand power imbalances or what we refer to as power asymmetry. So who makes decisions and who is excluded from those decisions on the ground. Where you have multiple actors operating, as Matt mentioned, um, then the, I, the goal here is to understand whose voices are the most dominant within that space and whose voices tend to be more excluded or who is more influential. The next aspect of the governance analysis is to understand what we call the institutional landscape or the institutional framework, to use the word framework again. In other words, how are the different institutions that are meant to manage or make decisions on water set up? Is it originating from the state, private companies, NGOs, and how do those institutions come together? How coordinated are they? Um, or how are they set up? One unique aspect of our governance analysis is the inclusion of historical um, analysis or grievances in your quest to understand or in industry's quest to understand um, governance failure, where you try to tease out weaknesses in governance or where governance ineffectiveness actually happens. But a big part of it is history. So if it's prior to an operation, then the question becomes what sorts of grievances predate the operation, what kinds of violations may have occurred in the past in order to do better incorporating those into a new operation. Now in doing these three analysis, you will see from the slide that they map on to certain dimensions. In the report, these dimensions are characterized as indicators of effective governance. And there are a ton of indicators out there but in combining literature and, and what we know about governance and what symbolizes effective governance, we think what's important to pay attention to is first that is power equitably distributed in the space. Second is decision-making participatory to keep an eye on that or to try to incorporate that in trying to do a proper analysis of governance to understand how it operates. Very importantly, to understand if it's transparent and accountable across the different actors or stakeholders involved. And finally, we think it's very important to understand that governance links very well to the maintenance of hydrosocial relations. So here, in Jed's comment and in Ray's comment, they talked about indigenous people in particular. So there are uses of water transcend the physical use for say drinking or agriculture. So here, things like protection of cultural values, indigenous values around water, that ought to be respected are core indicators of effective governance. 
or core principles that ought to be incorporated um, in trying to understand a proper governance system within which an operation is carried out. Thanks, Ellis. Okay, so at this point, we have established the profile uh, using the lens of uh, wider adequacy and wider governance. And so the next step is to plug this into uh, a legal assessments uh, framework. So this blue part right here that will allow us to, to ask the right question to make sure that the human rights to water is being implemented. So to do that, we, that is uh, the lawyers uh, in our team, uh, took a step back uh, and really had a deep look at the international jurisprudence associated with human rights and their association with, uh, with water. And uh, based on this analysis, uh, we identified two key characteristics of human rights uh, that, uh, that really frame the backbone of, uh, of our uh, legal framework. So this first, the first characteristic is, uh, is that water is an independent and an interdependent human right, uh, meaning that it is a human right in its own, in its own sake, but we also uh, recognize that it plays a key role in the implementation of other uh, long established human rights. So based on this, we, uh, we built a three-tiered framework to, uh, to interpret the, uh, the governance and adequacy analysis that, that you just heard. The first tier uh, has to do with the requisite uh, components of, uh, of human rights. So this has to do with the independent characteristics of water as a human right. So we talked about adequacy. So here the triple AQ framework, availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality uh, characteristics of, of, uh, of water uh, come into mind. So this has been long established by the UN. The second dimension uh, of the requisite element uh, is the multidimensional characteristic of water. So this uh, ties really well into our, uh, our adequacy analysis. So water is not only an economic good, but also a good that has uh, cultural and sometimes spiritual uh, significance. And the third element, uh, the third requisite element is sustainability. So the, the right to water should not only be uh, implemented right now, but the ability of the community to, to, uh, to have access to water has to be sustained in the future, right? So sustainability and intergenerational equity dimension comes into play here. The second tier uh, of the assessment has to do with the interdependence nature of the human right to water. So we talk about cross-cutting obligation. So these are obligations that underlay all human rights. So for example, equal, uh, equal enjoyment of human rights uh, should be implemented, non-discrimination, uh, self-determination, the free disposition of natural resources, and uh, the non-deprivation of means of subsistence. And finally, the third tier has to do with interrelated rights. So these are other human rights that, has, that have been established uh, that are not specifically associated with water, but where water plays a key role in uh, the ability of these rights to be, uh, to be implemented. So you can think of the right to health, uh, the right to health environments that was uh, recently uh, established, the right to a standard of living, the right to work, and specific rights uh, associated with, uh, with indigenous people. So once we uh, once so we use these three tiers uh, essentially to uh, look at all the relationships between processes and stakeholder for the adequacy for the adequacy assessment and all the different dimensions of the uh, governance assessment, and for each process and stakeholder relation, we ask: Are the requisite elements of the human rights to water satisfied? So that's the first element: the independent nature of uh, the human rights to water while respecting uh, the two other tiers, that is the cross-cutting obligations and the interrelated human rights. So to our knowledge, this is actually the clearest uh, articulation of what the right to water is uh, from a legal perspective. Now, our framework allows us to tie this definition to observable characteristics of water adequacy and governance using the yellow and the uh, pink uh, parts of the framework that we presented earlier. So by bridging the gap between universal legal and ethical principles that we'll talk about in a minute and context specific impact assessments, uh, we really want to empower decision makers and managers at the operational level to ask the right questions to proactively address and implement the human rights to water uh, in their specific progress. So this is really the intended purpose uh, of our framework. So although it's an important part uh, in the process, the framework that we just described is only valuable to the extent that it can be embedded into a corporate responsibility culture that embraces human rights as a guiding principle. So to talk a little bit more about that, about kind of the, little, the slightly broader context, uh, in the following discussion, we'll hear from George Enderley, the professor uh, of business ethics at Notre Dame uh, School of Business, who will make important arguments on the importance of ethics and business. And then we'll hear uh, uh, from, um, 
Diane Desierto, uh, who really thought deeply about the, the legal uh, dimensions uh, of the framework. Well, thank you, Mark, and hi to everybody. In my short uh, presentation, I would like to explain what corporate responsibility for human rights means from the ethical perspective. And I refer to my recently published book, a Corporate Responsibility for Wealth Creation and Human Rights with Cambridge University Press. <clears throat> the fundamental question of ethics is, what should I do? What should we do? Confucius, a famous Chinese philosopher of the fifth century before Christ, made a remarkable statement, which I always quote at the beginning of my business ethics courses. He said, I quote, I, the teacher, can do nothing for those who do not ask themselves what to do, end quote. This means that we have to ask ourselves what we should do first before we ask what others should do. So what can we say from the ethical, philosophical perspective as distinct from the socio-hydrological, political and legal perspectives? Three points. First, corporate responsibility is to be defined in a deep ethical sense, not just CSR. Second, the three criteria and the human rights due diligence requirement of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are supported from the ethical perspective. And third, the relationship between the ethical and legal perspective needs to be considered in a differentiated way. On the one hand, legal requirements can be supported from the ethical perspective. And on the other hand, the ethical perspective may point to obligations and advice which go beyond the legal perspective. A little bit more about the first point. Corporate responsibility is based on a deep understanding of responsibility and applies to corporations as moral actors. Not moral persons, but moral actors. Responsibility is defined as, I quote, self-commitment originating from freedom in worldly relationships, end quote. Thus, it involves two poles of human action and it rejects Max Weber's this dichotomy of the ethics of convictions on the one hand and the ethics of consequences on the other hand. The two poles are the interior commitment of the actors to act responsibly, responsibly and on the other hand, their engagement in concrete relationships with other actors, with persons, organizations, communities, non-human beings and nature. With this deep understanding of corporate responsibility, business enterprises are motivated to engage in stakeholder dialogue with communities affected and to be potentially affected by water governance, as well as with other businesses, government agencies and civil society organizations. This responsibility of the enterprise is bigger, the more it contributes and the stronger its direct linkages are to the violation of human rights, in our case, particularly of the human rights to water. Moreover, corporate responsibility goes beyond the impact which can be attributed directly to the corporation and includes contributing to the fulfillment of human rights as public goods. In our study, particularly of the human rights to water as a public good. Why? Well, on the one hand, in many situations, it is difficult, if not impossible, to identify precisely how much a corporation actually contributes to the violation or fulfillment of a human right. And on the other hand, the corporation also benefits from the human rights regime and therefore has to contribute its part to support it. To my second point, the three criteria and the due diligence requirement, which are postulated by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, can be justified from the ethical perspective. They fulfill the three basic criteria which define ethical, ethically responsible action, namely 
first to be capable of acting, causing the results of action, and to do it knowingly and willingly. Thus, human rights due diligence helps to know and evaluate the risk of human rights violations and take responsibility in the ethical sense. And to my third point, the legal perspective and the ethical perspective of human rights are not identical, but they complement each other to a large extent. Many, but not necessarily all legal requirements are also supported from the ethical perspective. When, for, ex for example, a national court expands corporate legal responsibility to include protecting human rights against third party perpetrators, the ethical perspective is not necessarily provided and justified. On the other hand, ethical responsibility can go beyond legal responsibility. When, for example, a powerful corporation in a failed state is practically the only actor that can secure the right to water as a public good. To conclude, our framework takes the stance that corporations hold ethical responsibility insofar as they constitute moral actors. The ethical foundation of the UN guiding principles provide valuable guidance to specify to some extent corporate responsibility to respect the human right to water and other human rights. However, corporate responsibility from the ethical perspective is not limited not limited to this understanding. It may go beyond due to socio-economic circumstances and additional ethical considerations. Our framework develops the legal perspective in an extensive and sophisticated manner and applies it to a number of different cases. A similar process would be appropriate from the ethical perspective in dialogue with businesses, government agencies, civil society organizations, and impacted communities. Such a process has started in a variety of countries due to the impact of the UN guiding principles of business and human rights. It is also supported by a heightened awareness of business and human rights among practitioners, scholars, and students. See, for example, the first interdisciplinary textbook on business and human rights by Florian Wittstein. So our framework provides a pathway for advancing this engagement. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, George. Um, we really appreciate your comments and your insights on why businesses and corporations should feel compelled to pursue a water stewardship and human rights agenda. Uh, so thank you from the ethical pers perspective. And now it's my pleasure um, to invite Diane Desierto, the architect of the legal formations in our framework, to reflect on the importance of an implementation-based human rights framework for wa water stewardship. And just for a little bit of profile, um, Diane is the faculty director of the International Human Rights Law Program at the Notre Dame Law School. She is also a professor in the Keough School for Global Affairs. Um, she's a member of the expert group of the United Nations Working Group on the Right to Development, a resource expert for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and the former director of studies and faculty at the Hague Academy of International Law. And so with that, I will pass off to you, Diane. Thank you, Lizzie, and thank you as well to colleagues in our interdisciplinary team, and thank you to BHP as well for its support of its work. I share the same sentiments flowing from Professor Enderly that indeed the legal framework is a baseline. It is a shared baseline for businesses, for water intensive industries, as well as for states and constituencies and populations to undertake a common shared conversation on how to implement human rights. However, it is by no means the ceiling on where that conversation should go. Our integrated framework sets us up or sets up the entire ecosystem of water providers, water intensive industries, civil society, populations, regulators, and the full constellation of those who operate in water intensive spaces to have that shared baseline understanding and contextual approach towards implementing the human right to water and related rights within the water intensive industries. But it should by no means constrict us in our analysis of where businesses could go further 
especially from the ethical standpoint. Now, why would we have, proceeding from everything that we've heard so far, what is the impetus for us to take a look at human rights implementation, which is often a more difficult task, as opposed to, say, taking a look at human rights accountability? From a legal standpoint, accountability comes in often in situations of breakdown already, breakdown and disrepair within operational contexts where at best, what the lawyers hope to do is to try and recover some measure of accountability or some legislative or policy measure to be implemented to redress any experienced harms. Our framework already antedates that process of looking at how to redress harms by directly looking at the more challenging task of how to implement the very complex concepts of human rights to water and related rights. The challenge with current rights-based methodologies and approaches is that they focus on checklists, indicators, and the famous ones involving the AAAQ framework, adequacy, availability, accessibility, and quality framework that largely originates from the work of the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights at the United Nations. But all of these attempt to standardize the elements of the human right in question, one right, the human right to water, across a vast range of operational fronts. The challenge then with this approach, as I've discovered in my own research, is that how would you capture the operational context in the process of translating human rights into implementation on the ground for actors on the ground? So in my own research, in the book that I published in 2015 with Oxford University Press, Public Policy in International Economic Law, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights in Trade, Finance, and Investment, I led the research in examining, first and foremost, how to operationalize and give concrete form to the implementation of very complex economic, social, cultural rights to health, to education, to water, to adequate standard of living, among others. And one of the discoveries that I made in the course of my research and what also impelled me to work closely with colleagues in interdisciplinary spaces here at the university is that the implementation of human rights requires a deeply contextual approach, contextually driven to understand, especially in the context of the human right to water, the hydrological, environmental, social, cultural, and governance conditions that are extremely crucial for setting up mid-level managers and operations design teams for success by enabling them to frame and ask the essential questions for implementation of what are essentially interdependent human rights obligations. So rather than prescribing elements, we instead empower these particular operators to set up the questions necessary within theater of their operations to take a look at interrelated rights from the human right to water, to health, to a healthy environment, to an adequate standard of living, to sustainability, right alongside the cross-cutting obligations that Mark Mueller discussed earlier on non-discrimination and self-determination and the free disposition of natural resources, how there must be equal enjoyment of human rights in different contexts. The significance of this and the overriding significance that I myself have witnessed in the course of my work for the United Nations and in our continuing work in looking at development as an interdisciplinary context is that if we pay close attention to the challenges of implementation of human rights, our deeper emphasis, whether as the state, which is the primary duty bearer in this context, working in partnership with industry, which may be acting as an agent of the state or may be working in partnership with the state, the primary emphasis here will be on the factual, granular, contextual, legal, and policy-driven aspects of realizing the right while taking into account the widest possible participation and deepest possible content of participation from multiple constituencies. Even when we talk about populations, they are not in any way homogenous. The interests of riverine communities vis-a-vis -vis indigenous communities versus urban settlers versus 
downstream users and upstream users of water are all varied in different contexts, which is why it was always quite inaccurate to look at the approach of right-based rights -based methodologies as simply just prescribing a set of checklists or indicators. So we flipped the script. We looked at the dimensions of adequacy, governance, and human rights. We emphasize how to optimally design policy and operational planning in relation to that human right to water and related rights by asking the right questions. And we illustrated how that could be done in concrete case study approaches that enabled individualized, contextualized, and multidisciplinary integration of the various framework, various rights involved apart from the human right to water, but also its related rights. By focusing ultimately on adequacy, which is really where the three components of adequacy, multidimensionality and sustainability, where most existing frameworks only take a look at adequacy, do not take a look at multidimensionality or sustainability. What this framework does is it invites a broader conversation within the industries and outside the industries, employing both a qualitative and a quantitative mixed methods approach to be able to address those precise questions at discrete points in the operational context. So the approach here, if you want to think about it in its most essential form, is to ask the right questions and understand the operational context. Ultimately, that is what I've discussed right here in this book, which has spurred its own stream of research and also our own understandings at the United Nations with regard to looking at the expansion of the human right to development. It is less about the act of prescription and it is intended to ensure that human rights is not just a floor, but rather aspires towards the ceiling of the exact ethical dimensions that Professor Enderly has described for everybody. So I hope in a nutshell that that captures the distinction and the significance of being able to assist water intensive industries as well as regulators uh, to have this conversation outside of the, the, the tense environment of accountability and remediation, which often already deals with matters after the fact. This enables us to have the conversation in a preventive manner well before there is any experience of harm. And if done right, and if followed closely, would enable the greatest possible participation from stakeholders in a way that hasn't been seen before. And for this, I'm grateful for the collaboration with fellow colleagues at our Notre Dame interdisciplinary team, as well as our partnership with BHP for enabling us to start this discussion in the most timely fashion, especially this year where the human right to water has widely been given prominence within the United Nations system. Thanks to everybody and let me turn over to Lizzie. All right, thanks Diane so much. So we have been able to save some time um, for you all, the audience, to ask us questions that you might have, whether it be about our framework, whether it be about um, why BHP has um, chosen to support us in developing the framework, um, or really anything that might have come up during today's session. So I already see that we have one comment in the, um, the platform, the World Water Week platform. So we'll go to that question first. Um, but I will just say, um, as a correction, that you can put comments in both our Zoom chat or on the World Water Week platform. So feel free to um, comment wherever you would like to or feel most comfortable. Um, we will wait for a couple moments if people have extra questions, and then we will move on to a closing from Tom. But to at least address the question that has already been asked, thank you so much, Serene. Um, and it looks like if people go to the World Water Week platform, they'd see it. She talks a little bit about the fact that only four countries have it explicitly in their constitution within um, the continent of Africa, um, the outlining of the human right to water. And there are about 11 countries that have it in their legislation. And so, and she's saying that in the rest of the countries, um, the human right to water is more of an implicit um, uh, concept. And so she's saying, if I'm if I'm understanding your question correctly, Serene, that you're saying that our framework is great, but it might be able to only work in enabled environments. So how do we take that into consideration? 
And so I might turn this question over first to Diane, if that's all right. So maybe talk about actually how our framework might be able to work in disabling environments. Um, and then if any of our other PIs would like to jump in, um, they're more than welcome to. Thanks, Lizzie. My short answer to this question is that there are about 175 countries that are party to an international treaty called the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, which does provide for the human right to water within the penumbra of the right to an adequate standard of living. So to the extent that states already do have these obligations in existence as treaty obligations, it's already an, an attempt to assist them in implementing those treaty obligations within their respective jurisdictions. Independent of the treaty, however, there have been many other courts that have also looked at the customary dimension of the human right to water, independent of its existence as a human right um, treaty provision. So there are two possible sources for this. It is not entirely required that it should be in the constitutions of any particular countries. Um, do our PIs have anything, our other PIs have anything to add to that? Yeah. Right. Or Ellis? Uh, yeah, go for it. A uh, great question, I think. Yeah, and it's true that very few countries, particularly in Africa, but one thing to keep in mind is that even with the few countries that have human rights to water codified either constitutionally or otherwise, it centers more on, on drinking water. Our framework goes much beyond that. And I think Diane's answer is perfect in alluding to the fact that at the end of the day, it defers more to international law and which treaties the countries are parties to, um, as opposed to whether they, uh, they constitutionalize the human right to water in their own national jurisdictions or not. So that's where we see value that with or without a constitutional protection that the framework still offers some value because we look more beyond the national boundaries to international spaces or international law in how the framing um, is expected to work. Thanks, Alice. I also might turn this question over to Jed and Anne. I don't know if you have any perspectives to add from a, um, from a corporate point of view about how companies might be propelled to act and engage ethically, even in low governance um, situations and how you think maybe our framework might play out when, they, when it might not be obvious that they have the obligation to do, do, to do so. Uh, thank, thanks, Elizabeth. I think, um, you know, I, I think sometimes the, uh, the point you touched on there about the fact that it's not obvious is probably where this framework comes comes into play, um, because sometimes, you know, understanding your obligations uh, in a situation like this can, can be difficult. And as Ella said, the uh, typically where there are some sort of human rights legislation with respect to water, it typically is limited to to drinking water, at least in our little experience in this space. So. You know, I think that's where the framework can help is to is to provide a bit of structure to what those obligations are. Great, thanks, Jed. All right, I see we have a second question from Najan. Thank you so much. Um, you asked, has BHP tested or piloted the applicability of your frame of the framework in your organization, perhaps an asset to confirm implementation effectiveness? Um, maybe I'll start first with asking BHP this question, and then I might also ask Mark Muller to talk a little bit more about our case studies. PHP? Yeah, well, the short answer is no. No, we haven't yet. Um, and that's and the approach has been to develop up some, some case studies, which is where I think Mark can can step in and describe a little bit further what that's uh, what that's bringing out. Yeah, so I mean, the, the framework is, uh, is recent enough that it's still, so to say, in beta test. So we're applying it to, uh, you know, famous or so, you know, known cases uh, uh, involving relationships between ex extractive water industries and uh, and, and local community. Uh, and our uh, our goal is to build up a database uh, of different cases to kind of give a model of how this framework might be implemented in very different types of industry, from mining to agriculture to uh, hydropower production, uh, textile, uh, etc. So we're building a database to uh, to to build to come up with implementation cases that could be used as, as examples to implement the framework elsewhere. 
Yeah, thanks so much. George, would you like to say something? You're on mute, George, here. Let me hold on. Let me get you off mute. You're still on mute, George. Okay, now it works. Well, yes. uh, Chad told us that BHP is in the business for over 100 years. And uh, that means, you know, to apply a long term perspective is very important here. What does it mean to be committed to those, uh, to the right to water and to other human rights? Is not the thing uh, just opportunistically to treat, with, uh, to, to be treated for uh, over a couple of weeks. And, and that's why I think it's important to uh, really take the long term perspective uh, uh, seriously and, and then. Uh, to find out what is the right thing to do today and in the next few years also in the short term. But without the long term perspective, that commitment, as I said, responsibility is a commitment out of freedom in worldly relationships means if you have a big, a big power, uh, well, with big power comes big responsibility. And, and so the long term perspective is extremely important, I think. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, George, for that contribution. Um, so I see a question from Molly. Thank you so much. Um, and you say that you're a junior rapporteur working on reporting of the week. And you ask, what are the main challenges in getting other major industries to follow this framework in the aspiring work of BHP? And who can push for more industries to join this? So I'll probably pass off to Jed and Anne if either of you have anything to say about challenges in pushing for other industries to value this framework. Uh, I mean, I, I think the first thing would, would, would be that um, people need to see some value in it. They, they need to understand why this is, you know, something to, to put, their, put their effort into. And, and I guess that's where sessions like this can can start to help by uh, by publicising it, but also by inviting some some comment and feedback on that. And I know that the the University of Notre Dame team is also doing a lot of work to to test it further with you know with your peers and with others who who can uh, demonstrate or test you know how how effective they think this framework will be. Um, but yeah, I think that the challenges are that it needs people or organisations need to see the value, and that it also needs to be practical. It needs to be something that you can take and, and use in a practical sense. Um, and so that will need to be demonstrated a little bit over time as well. Yeah, I think uh, to add to that, um, there are plenty of examples of industries, uh, water intensive industries, um, who have not got it right because they've used previous approaches, which as Diane said, are sort of more of a checklist approach. So we really, you know, see that uh, if, as Jed says, if other industries see the value of taking a more preventative approach and being able to go into a place where they don't know what they don't know and have some really good guidance on how do you ask really good questions to understand the context and to be able to go into uh, a new project or a new place in a much better way that gives you those longer term beneficial outcomes. Um, you know, I think people have understood that we, you know, haven't had a great way of doing it in the past. So we're hoping that they'll be encouraged by looking at a more holistic preventative way going forward. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, so we're going to take one more question just to respect everyone's time. And then if you have additional questions um, at the very end of this presentation, there'll be an information informational slide with our with um, an email that you can reach out to. But our last question is from Andrew, who asks, is it possible to integrate this framework into the corporate reporting of TCFD or maybe better the TNFD? I'm not sure who to direct this question to. So maybe I'll just say anyone who feels like they can answer this um, Feel, feel free to, to speak up about this. I um, haven't really thought about it. Um, I guess in terms of, because the framework is very helpful in asking you to um, ask the right questions, 
perhaps in terms of how you look at the risks that the uh, risks and opportunities uh, that the TNFD asks you to disclose, it, it, it could potentially provide a really good thinking framework for how you think through those risks. So in other words, ask, uh, help you to ask the right questions to frame what the risks uh, and the opportunities might be. So yeah, definitely something worth more thought, um, but that would just be my initial impressions. Ellis, you want to add anything to that? No, I was going to ask about, is that sort of an industry term? So I wasn't familiar with it, then I could say a bit more, but I think Anne's answer um, takes care of it. I think if I'll just add um, to this, I mean, part of what's in the TCFD also doesn't standardize the nature of what's reported. And so the characterization of risk also is largely driven from the perspective of the corporate actor. So if you're the corporate actor that takes a broad understanding of risks, which really in this framework, since you're looking at multidimensional um, factors in adequacy and governance and sustainability, you actually might end up with a strong baseline for, for capturing multiple sources of risk um, in relation to climate related disclosures. Great, thanks so much everyone for that. So we're almost at time. So I am gonna close the discussion for now. Um, and as I said, at the end of our presentation, we'll have a slide up so that if you have more questions or want to learn more about our framework, um, read our briefs, um, you're more than welcome to um, reach out to us directly for any further inquiries. So now I'm gonna invite Tom Piracal, the Innovation and Practice Program Director here at Pulte to provide just a couple of closing remarks. Thanks, Tom. Great. Thanks, everybody. What a fantastic conversation. And thanks very much for the excellent questions that came from the plenary. I, I, coming off of the conversation today and the, the points that you heard, both from our colleague, for, first from Ray and, and our colleagues at BHP, as well as our, our, our fantastic faculty at Notre Dame, these are some of the next steps or more immediate actions that we feel are important. Uh, to consider as we move forward and, and considering again this broad range of stakeholders that are involved with this complex issue. So, so thinking about first governments um, and how this would be pushing governments to develop legislation that incorporates this full view of the right to water uh, across some of these multi-dimensional aspects of environmental, social, cultural uses, ensuring that we are kind of thinking about this again, holistically and, and across these, these various facets of, of, of water usage. Uh, also to enable space for dialogue between industry and communities, promoting transparency and this free flow of information uh, so that all the actors involved can make decisions based on strong evidence. And so as opposed to um, contributing to power dynamics where, where one actor might have more information in which uh, they're, they're kind of making uh, decisions on. So, so really allowing for this, this open access to information across actors. And so uh, the, the next stakeholder that we identify is the business community as we've spoken with. So considering how implementation approaches could be strengthened by a human rights evaluation that considers the short and long-term impacts on communities. And so thinking especially about advancing equity and rights proactively as good uh, for business and society. And as Dan and Ann mentioned, both kind of ensuring that we ask the right questions, looking more holistically across the very dimensions of water across the adequacy framework, sustainability, as well as these cross-cutting obligations and interrelated rights that Mark referenced. Uh, the next set of actors would be this human rights community and making sure that we embed this framework or similar ones among surveillance and regulatory bodies to, to the, one of the questions that came up from, from the audience uh, and regulatory bodies and other civil society institutions that are working across these water intensive industries. So where industries will really uh, kind of really work to, to, to kind of set these standards among themselves and, uh, and that where these are embedded within these regulatory frameworks and, and uh, institutions that are, that are helping to govern this. And to push for a culture shift away from just purely monitoring violations and promoting more of this proactive implementation-centered strategy. 
so again, thinking where industries can set standards that enable them to be a force for good. And understanding, uh, as George had mentioned, that we are all we all benefit from a human rights-based approach in some way. So, and then also looking at this research community, uh, such as Notre Dame and others who are working in this space, to continue to continue to explore the human right to water in industrial contexts and push for this greater inclusion and involvement of interdisciplinary methods of analysis. And then also, as, as uh, Mark had mentioned, um, kind of generating an evidence base of case studies and, and as we're thinking about developing this database uh, with the objective of identifying factors that contributed to successful outcomes that communities and industries can take as models in order to strengthen pre-existing frameworks such as ours. So um, that's it. Thanks to everybody for your contribution and participation today. And uh, we, we, we uh, look forward to working and engaging with all of you going forward. And thanks again to our colleagues at BHP um, and, uh, and our faculty at Notre Dame and to Lizzie uh, for, uh, for helping to MC today's session. Yeah, thanks so much, Tom. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, here is just um, uh, some contact information. If you guys have more questions and you would like to follow up with any of us, you're more than welcome to send them to me and then I'll funnel them to the appropriate members of our team. Um, and so we'll leave this on for about another minute, um, but just wanna say thank you so much for giving us your time um, and your energy and your attention. Um, we really appreciate it. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. So thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna end the recording now. Okay, bye everyone.